Well, it's nice to see you again after this summer. It feels like a long time has passed. I promise you I was not on vacation the whole time. Actually, I was uh, on a number of trips, including two to Africa for work. And they, those trips actually, especially to Africa, helped me to frame a little bit my comments tonight. Is anyone feeling a little confused about Jesus' response to this story about the steward? Raise your hands if you're feeling a little confused. Okay, I promise you, you're not alone. I'm right there with you. Especially in light of Amos, the prophet's critique of these greedy people who can't wait for the temple services and Sabbath to be over, to set up their tables and get back to business, and they really don't do anything more than give God lip service. In light of Paul's letter about how people who are in positions of authority and resource should use that resource in order for the good of people, for their peace, their tranquility, and their prosperity. This is not what this crafty steward is all about. So let's look at this a little bit more carefully. I have to tell you, I had to enlist some help from friends. I've got a men's scripture group that meets every once in a while, and it's businessmen and lawyers. So you can imagine they shed a different light on this gospel. We have the master. He's a rich land, landowner, probably with many, many tenants people who are using his property for growing wheat, for growing olive trees, for raising pasture. Then there's the steward, kind of like his CFO, right? And the CFO has been dealing with these debtors in a very underhanded way, and the master discovers this. What has the CFO been up to? My friend said, he's probably not just skimming off the top. In fact, if you look at what he's done with each of these debtors, he's probably added a surcharge to their debts of up to 20 to 100%, right? This guy's really bold. And when tenants couldn't pay the debt, the law required that they would be put in prison so they didn't pay anyone. The money didn't go to the master. The money didn't go back to their families. It was a terrible state of affairs. But this seemed to be what the steward was up to. Now, he gets called on the carpet. What's he going to do? He's got to look out for himself. So he changes his practice for very self-serving reasons. He reduces the debt simply by taking his exorbitant surcharge out of the equation, right? He tricks these unsuspecting debtors to think that he's actually doing them a favor. He wins friends, right, by basically enlisting them and giving him a favor in return so that he'll go, they'll go and offer him a place in their houses. And instead of cheating his master out of this, this, these debts, the master is able to collect, right? He impresses the master who praises him for his action. Now, I honestly don't think that Jesus is praising this man for his dishonesty or exploitation. I think what he is praising is the fact that the steward has changed his ways and hopefully, eventually maybe, his greedy heart. Jesus is not condemning people simply for making uh, commerce, right? for making money. And I don't say that simply because I'm the dean of a business school, right? He does condemn greed and excessive luxury, right? Remember the story about the rich man who basically steps over Dives, the, the leper, at his front gate and has these rich sumptuous feasts and doesn't even give a scrap to Dives. Jesus condemns that kind of luxury. Jesus condemns exploitation of the poor. For instance, those Pharisees that create these tithes on all these commodities, and they, they take that money for themselves. Jesus condemns exploitation of the poor. And he, he condemns insensitivity, right, to the needs of those who have um, great, a great deal more than, than, than we have for food or for clothing 
For instance, in the story of the Good Samaritan, right? He condemns those who step around the man who's been robbed. He praises, he praises us. When we make a fundamental option for God and for the service of others, more than ourselves. I didn't say we didn't serve ourselves, but just more than ourselves. Jesus praises honest conduct, generosity, sensible simplicity as he himself lives it, and trust in God's providence more than material security. We might think of recent examples like Pope Francis, who got rid of his Mercedes to drive around in a family car. Actually, it's a Fiat, and I don't mean anything against Fiat, but when my family had a Fiat back in the 70s, not so reliable. I hope the Pope does better. Or we have another extraordinary example in Mother Teresa, a powerful figure who could really enlist those who are rich and powerful to use that wealth always on behalf of those who are most needy. Remarkable. But let's face it, they're religious folks, right? What about Warren Buffett, right? One of the most wealthy and successful investors in the history of this country. He is also one of the most generous and philanthropic and has influenced a whole generation of, of his to do the same thing, to give back more than he seeks to take. And many have followed suit. Or we might think of a popular entertainer like Bono from the, the band U2, who uses his influence on behalf of those in Africa. Or even more close to home, I think of my grandma Nina, who was an immigrant from Italy, who worked hard her whole life, who had a few nice things, didn't you know, live in luxury, and was always very careful to, to maintain a kind of sensible simplicity. Or my grandpa Fred, who said to me once, you know, when I said, oh, I love having, you know, uh, enough money to go out for a, a weekend. He'd said, no, you don't love that money. You can only love people. As dean of the business school at Lemoyne, I have met countless people who have their priorities straight, who know that making money is also about creating value, and it's about working for the good of others and making workplaces better and more meaningful and, and satisfying and not, not damaging the planet in the process. As we examine our own lives and our relationship to money, to the world, Jesus confronts us with the challenge. Where have we placed our fundamental option? You know? If we had a sandwich and we pass somebody who's hungry, do we stop and give half? Do we translate that to the way that we also look at our own lives and the way that we use money in our households and in our businesses? Are we mindful of the needs of others? This is what it boils down to. We hear those words of Paul in his letter to Timothy, God desires that all be saved. You and I, my friends, must be part of that process by reaching out to those whose needs are greater than our own.